Okay, so welcome to Math 150. This is lecture four. And what I want to do today is talk about sequences and series. So by now you should have read at least the first half of chapter 10. By you know, Monday, you should have finished reading chapter 10. I will go through much of the material. If there are parts of it that you find confusing that you really want me to emphasize in class, let me know. What I want to do is I want to use class time effectively to do things that aren't in the books. And so what I want to really do is talk to you about how you make conjectures. You know, treating math almost like an experimental science. How can we look at the data and try to get a sense of what is going on? So I'm going to just make sure that it is recording. Yes, it's recording. Excellent. OK. And so what I want to do is I want to start off with some sequences. So the first one, 1 equals 1. It's not that big of a deal. What's 1 plus 3? Four. Next one. Next one. Next one. Next one. How did you do the last one so quickly? So how did you add one plus two plus five plus seven plus nine plus eleven so quickly? Excellent. So you know we're doing them in order, and so since we know the pre. The previous one was 25. All we have to do is take what was the previous sum and add the last one, add the next number. So we often talk about sequences and series. The sequence is the terms, the series is the sum. And so if I give you the sum of the first five terms, then to get the sum of the first six terms, well, using that knowledge, I just have to add the next one. Right, does anybody notice any patterns? 1, 4, 9, 16, 25, 36. It's the squares. How do you figure which square is associated to which sum? You know, is the next one going to be 49 or could it maybe be 100? What's the connection? The order in which they appear. And is there anything you notice about the number of terms on the left? Yes. It's the number squared. The first one is one, it's one squared. The second one is the first two odds, it's two squared. The next one is the first three odds, it's three squared. So we now have a conjecture. So the conjecture is the sum of the first n odds is n squared. Now we did the 16 over 64 in this class, right? Yes, so we've seen that just because something holds for a while, it may not keep holding. But we're pretty confident here. This is looking pretty good. And we could check it further and further and further. That's not a proof. Uh, there's actually a really nice geometric proof of this. There's one. Here's one plus three. What's one plus three? Four. And now notice for the next one, I'm adding five dots. And so you can see with a little bit of work that as I keep going at the next level, I'm adding the next odd number. So I want to show that I'm always adding two more odds. Well, what I'm really doing is all of these numbers go down. All of these numbers go down. Right? And so that's my previous odd number. Oh, but wait. This one has two numbers coming from it. So I get an extra plus one. I'm going to put it over here. An extra plus one from this one, because that one was counted twice. And then I have to add this one over here. So that every time I add my next you know, giant L, it's going to be two more than the dots in the previous row, or the previous L. And that's why it's always going to be the next odd number. So this is a nice geometric proof that the sum of the first n odd numbers is n squared. In general, it is very hard to find closed form expressions for sums. We can often give some idea of what the sum is, but to get a closed form expression is often extremely difficult. These are going to be very useful when we get to the fundamental theme of calculus, which gives us areas under curves. So you should have hopefully seen Riemann sums in one of your previous classes. If not, we will quickly cover those. But to do that, we need to evaluate sums. Whenever you have an infinity, there's always a danger. And so you know, with these sums, these sums are, being, are getting larger and larger and larger. They're going off to infinity. 
when we have them as Riemann sums, we'll be dividing by the thickness, which is often going to give us something that will have a finite limit. One of the other big ones we need is the following. So just very quickly, it's going to be 1, 3, 6, 10, 15, 21. It's a little bit harder to see what the pattern is here. Does anybody know the formula for the sum of the first n integers? So it turns out it's n, n plus one over two. Once I give you the formula, you can verify that it's true, at least for specific choices of integers. This is not a proof, but you can at least see that it's reasonable. If you believe it's a polynomial, there are some tricks you can do. And you know, later in the semester, I'll actually talk about a new method I've come up to prove stuff like this using L'Hopital's rule. So it's a really strange application of L'Hopital. There's a story that you know, one of the greatest mathematicians of all time, Gauss, was in school and the teacher was just having one of those days. You know, we've all had those days when we just don't want to do what we have to do. And so the teacher told the little brats, add up the numbers from one to 100, and was expecting to be able to have a little bit of time to relax. Almost immediately, Gauss lets out 5,050. And so the question was, how did Gauss get it so quickly? Well, what Gauss noticed is, you know, if you take all the numbers from one to 100, and then add them in reverse order, What do you get? What's one plus 100 if I keep going down? 101, 101, 101. So how many times do I have 101? 100 times, but I've counted everything twice. And there's the formula. If you want to prove it for n rather than proving for 100, just do a search and replace. So this idea is beautiful. It works for the sum of integers, but it doesn't work for sums of squares, cubes, and higher. There are other techniques we have to do stuff like that. How many of you out of curiosity have seen proofs by induction? Okay, so if you've seen proofs by induction, that's a great way for proving stuff like this. You need to know what you're trying to prove. You need to know the target. There are tricks that will allow you to figure that out. These become very important in checking to see that the fundamental theme of calculus is correct. All right. So what I want to do now is I want to shift to the I love rectangles game. If you are able to beat me at this, I will give you $100. Okay. What is the best shape in the world? Rectangle. Yeah, exactly. That's why, you know, this is not the I love triangles. This is not the I love circles. This is the I love rectangles game. So you must put things down in such a way that at every moment in time, there is a rectangle. Okay, so you have a bunch of pieces of various sizes. So we're going to do basically a tiling game. So imagine I give you a really boring floor like this. Can you come up with a way to tile this? And if so, what kind of shape would you use for your tiling? And when you look at this, this should be a very natural shape that you want to use to tile. What shape? Square. How big of a square? Yeah, a bunch of little squares. So if I do a bunch of little squares, you know, one by one, I can start tiling down and filling it over. You can ask more generally, what about other shapes? You know, can I tile things with a triangle, with a square, with a pentagon, with a hexagon? So does anybody know which shapes like this could tile and have them all fit together perfectly? Yes. So I'm now just asking to cover to cover the entire infinite plane. So it doesn't have to be no longer the square from a moment ago. I just want to tile everything without any gaps, fitting together perfectly. Yes. Yes. So which ones of these do you think I can use just that shape and it will work? It depends which triangle. So I'm all, I'm giving you the equilateral triangle. But you've got to put things together in such a way that you have no gaps. So one of these shapes should be, oh, yes. The equal out triangle will work. And one of the reasons it works is it works because the hexagon works. 
So if I chop up the hexagon, I can write the hexagon as six triangles. And then what I can do for the hexagon, and you know, there's a lot of great math theory about you know, covering, you know, this is you know, not a great drawing, but this should hopefully give you a sense of how you can do things with hexagons. So the hexagon works, equal our triangle works because you can get it with the hexagon. There's one other shape here that shouldn't be too hard to figure out that it works. But yeah, the square. And then the question is, can you do it with a pentagon? Can you do it with a heptagon, a seven-sided figure? Yes. Is it just any shape that the um, angle is a factor of 360? So that's an excellent conjecture because if they're going to come around, I'm going to have to have an integer number. And so I would have to look at 360 divided by n. What would be the possibilities? And as your figure starts getting more and more sizes, what happens to the angle? It's growing. And so, you know, by the time I'm at a pentagon, my angle is, I think, 72 degrees. The hexagon, oh, no, no, it's more than 72 degrees. Um, I think it's 180 minus 72, maybe. Uh, the hexagon is already at 120 degrees. And so if it's got to be something that goes into 360, I'm fast running out of trouble. You know, once I get up to 180 degrees, it's a straight line. So without too much work, you can actually figure out which are the possible shapes that can work. Most of you are never going to spend your life trying to tile bathroom floors or other stuff like this. The reason I want to talk about this is this is a problem you've hopefully seen. And I want to talk to you very briefly about how you might generalize this. So one way you could generalize this is look at other shapes. Maybe I can use two different shapes. Maybe I can use an octagon and a square. And if I use those two, maybe it's not going to fit together perfectly, but maybe I can get the square to come in. So that's one way to generalize this, to allow yourself more pieces. Another is to go into higher dimensions. What if I did this in three dimensions? Can somebody give me a three-dimensional piece that should work? A cube. And can we think of anything other than a cube that's going to fit together nicely? What if you go up into four dimensions? So whenever you're studying things, you always want to ask, how can I push this further? All right. So let's get to the I Love Rectangle game. If you beat me, you get $100. I did this at Williamstown Elementary a few days ago. So the kids there are really curious to see if you guys can beat me. All right. Here is how it works. You have one of each size square. You have one one by one, one two by two, one three by three, one four by four, and so on. OK? And your goal is to place the shapes down one at a time so that at every moment, the shape you have on the ground is a rectangle. It can never be anything other than a rectangle. You cannot cheat. You cannot put one piece on top of another piece. They have to be flat on the table, and it has to be a rectangle. OK? So I will go first. Um, I like Legos. I teach classes on Legos. I will take one of my Lego pieces and I have now made a rectangle. Does everyone agree I have one rectangle? If you can get two, you beat me and get $100. So I'll give you a minute to see if you can use the shapes and do better. So there are some conjectures from students that the game is rigged. So why do you think this game is rigged? Yes. Because as long as they are differently sized squares, anytime you try and put down another piece, there's going to be some unevenness. So Good. Piece. Yeah. Yeah. So let's say I put down the four by four piece. If I want to keep it as a rectangle, what must be the dimensions of whatever I put down next? Four by four. Do I have any other four by four pieces? No. There's no way you can win. Right? If I try to put like a three by three next to it, it's not going to work. So the game is rigged, all right? So sometime I will tell you about the one time I actually did a game where it was not rigged and I could have been on the hook for over $100,000 with admissions. So I'll, I'll, tell about, I'll tell that on Monday if somebody reminds me. So let's modify the game so that there's a chance to do something interesting. I am no longer gonna have $100 on the table though. So you all agree that with what I give you, the game is born. 
you can only put down one tile before the game ends. I have to give you at least one more tile. What is the cheapest thing I can give you? Okay, once more, well, what's the dimension? One by one. So I will now give you um, an additional one by one. Okay, so you have two one by ones and then one of every other piece. And now see how many you can put down. All right, does everybody understand the game now? It's gotta be a rectangle at every moment, but now you have two one by one pieces. And so let me give you guys another one by one piece. You can start with whatever you want. So can we start with the one by one? Yes. Okay, let me just pause the recording. Okay, so it looks like everybody discovered exactly what you need to do. Clearly, and again, I care about the thought process the most right now. You have to start with one of the one by one pieces because that's what I gave you. And if you don't use that, then you're back to the previous case and we know it can't be done. So I have to start with the one by one. And the only thing I can do next is I have to put the other one by one by it. It's very nice in life when things are forced. You don't have to worry about, am I making the right decision? Um, yes, because I have no other choice. What's the only thing I can do now? Yes, two by two. How many places do I have to put the two by two? Two. And so I actually had four places to put the second one by one. I have two places I could place it up or down. For the next one, uh, I placed it down. What do I put down next? Three by three, how many choices do I have? Two. So from this point onward, I'm always going to have two choices. I'm gonna to choose to put this to the left. For the next one, I'm gonna to choose to put it above. And so on and so on and so on. So for the next one, I'll put it to the right. So there's a rhyme and reason to what I'm doing. So if we look at the sequence of numbers, <clears throat> it's first a one by one, one by one, two by two, three by three, five by five, eight by eight. So the numbers are one, one, two, three, five, eight. Anybody recognize these numbers? These are the Fibonacci's. So I am actually the president elect of the Fibonacci Association. There is a international association of Fibonacci's. My two major accomplishments are increasing the number of board members to 13, because I thought it was absurd that the Fibonacci Association had you know, 12, board members were so close to a Fibonacci number, either make Fibonacci an honorary you know, board member emeritus or just add one more person. And then I'll see if I can maybe get the video to work for this. Um, but I made a Rubik's cube artwork on the Fibonacci's. So you can see the spiral coming in. This was held at one of the, the 18th International Conference, which was held in 2018 at a school founded in 1818. And so when I was going through security to get into Canada, the security guards wanted to uh, check and make sure that this was a legitimate uh, cube and it was not you know, a bomb or anything like that. And so they were very good about letting me, hmm, oh, I gotta maybe stop sharing the screen. They were very good about uh, letting me just you know, turn it a few times to demonstrate that it was not a bomb and not just have them just completely mess it up. So they, they were very, very kind for that. If people are interested, I am happy at some point, I'm going to do a class on just how to solve Rubik's Cubes. There's a lot of really good math and problem solving skills behind something like that. What I really want you to be getting out of this class is how to think about problems. This is why I'm spending time having you, you know, empirically discover the Fibonacci numbers and not just give you the sequence. You discover them yourselves. And they arise very naturally in a tiling problem. There's a wonderful video that I will share with you later that goes through a lot of stuff um, on the Fibonacci's, uh, each one in some of the previous two. This talks about a lot of the different places they occur in nature. So anybody here, biology or perspective biology? All right, what do leaves do for plants? Nutrients. Collect nutrients, How, which kind of nutrients? Sunlight. Sunlight. So when you're a plant, you want to maximize your sunlight exposure. One of the dangers is if you have a leaf on top of a leaf, the leaf on the bottom may not be getting as much sunlight as it could. 
So the leaves actually spiral around and the Fibonacci numbers and a related quantity, the Fibonacci angle is related to how leaves come to try to maximize exposure to sunlight. So I'll send you a link to the video. It's also in the slides. There's a lot of just fascinating places where the sequence arises. Um, one of the other things I want to show you is just how sometimes adopting a different perspective allows you to solve problems that you might have trouble with otherwise. So can anybody tell me what is the area of this rectangle? Or give me a math problem to solve for its area. Yes. 21 times 34. But it's also 1 squared plus 1 squared plus 2 squared plus 3 squared plus 5 squared plus 8 squared plus 13 squared plus 21 squared, because they all fit together. This is a geometric proof that the sum of the squares of the first n Fibonacci's is the nth times the n plus first. So a lot of times in mathematics, the way we make progress is we connect something to something else. And the hope is that one of them we can do. Anybody here ever play with fuse beads? These are little circle um, objects. You put them on pegboards and then you iron them and they fuse together. Okay, yes. So my daughter and I have done some work on this. We are actually redoing, because we didn't do a great job the last time on the 55 by 55. So hopefully by Monday's class, I will be able to bring a giant you know, Fibonacci fuse bead uh, project to show you the applications. All right. I assume if I gave you problems like this, you could do these. You could find these approximate, you could find these fractions. Yes. How would you do it? So how would you calculate this? This is Miller's 21st century multivariable calculus class. How would you calculate this? Yes. Which, which? Calculator, all right? Calculator or computer program. You would not do these by long division. If you do them out, the first one is 0 0.01020304050607080009. The next one is 0104096253639644082. But then the pattern breaks down. The last one is 0101020305080131354055. Instead of 89, which is the next Fibonacci number, it's 90. The reason the patterns don't hold forever is well, these are two digit patterns. Eventually, one of my things is going to have three digits, and that digit is going to kick back. I could do things so it's instead of giving you this, I could give you 0010010002. And so the question is, where does stuff like this come from? Do you think I just tried a bunch of fractions and eventually locked out with you know, 10,100 divided by 970,299? Yes. I, this is why, you know, I, um, haven't taught this class in a while because it took me a while, you know, doing you know, a thousand divisions a day before I finally you know, hit pay dirt. When you see something like this, something deep is going on in the background. What's going on in the background is there's an infinite series. And there's an infinite series that has a beautiful closed form expression, which allows me to put in a specific value. I think it's x equals one over a hundred and get these answers. And so this is one of the themes of this part of the semester is trying to come up with ways to evaluate infinite sums. If I give you an infinite sum, you're not gonna add term by term by term and be finished in any fine amount of time. What you want to do is you wanna to try to get a sense of, does this seem to converge to something? Is there a closed form expression for this? And does that closed form expression equal my original function? So we've talked a little bit about Taylor series. How many of you out of curiosity have seen Taylor series before? Okay, it's not a prereq for this class. This is one of the big things we're going to be doing in this class. Taylor series are ways to approximate certain good functions with limits of polynomials. And polynomials are nice. Who here has ever used sine or cosine? Uh, you know, every hand should be up at this point. Okay, this is are you awake right now? Sine or cosine. They're really infinite series. You know, if I give you certain nice angles, you know, 30, 45, 60, and then halves of those and halves of those plus three, four, you know, stuff like that we can handle, but a general angle we can't do. 
and we have to use an infinite sum to evaluate them. So what I want to do now is I want to talk about the most important infinite sum there is, the geometric series and the geometric series formula. There is a way to understand the geometric series formula by playing a game of hoops and leading to a great concept in mathematics and economics. And so before class started today, a couple of people you know, demonstrated their basketball prowess. This is not an easy place to play with these low ceilings. You know, we really should have probably moved to the atrium you know, for today, you know, for class like this. All right, so what I wanna do is I wanna to talk to you about how we can prove the geometric series formula. Uh, you've probably seen the standard algebraic proof. I know is let's say the absolute value of X is less than one. If I let um, SN equal one plus X plus all the way up to X to the N, if I multiply by X, I just shift everything over by one. So if I subtract, I get one minus X times SN equals one minus X to the N plus one. So Sn is one over one minus x minus xn plus one over one minus x. And then if the absolute value of x is less than one, as n goes to infinity, Sn is gonna to go to one over one minus x. This is the standard algebra proof. How many of you have seen this algebra proof of the geometric series formula? When I'm looking at the finite sum, I don't need x to be less than one. For finite sums, everything is fine. If I want the limit to make sense, I need the absolute value of x to be less than one. Well, if you think about that, if the absolute value of x is greater than one, then every time I add, I'm adding pieces of larger and larger value, at least an absolute value. And so there's no way this is gonna converge. You know, if I'm adding two, then four, then eight, then 16, then 32, you know, it's not gonna converge to something finite. Even if it was negative, you know, I'm adding, you know, negative two, four, negative eight, 16. I'm getting wild fluctuations. So if I want to have a hope for things to converge, I need each piece to be less than one. In fact, I need each, well, from some point onward. From some point onward, each piece needs to be less than one. More than being less than one, I need each piece to be going to zero as I go further and further down. If the pieces aren't going to zero, if every piece is eventually at least one third, well, that I can't converge because every time I add, I'm gonna add at least a third. As I do this longer and longer and longer, I'm gonna just keep growing and growing and growing. So the first test we have for a series you know, to converge is that the pieces have to be tending to zero. So there's a huge difference between what's called a necessary condition and a sufficient condition. Anybody ever see dodgeball? What is it necessary for him to do? And he says, is it necessary for me to? All right, I... nope, nope, nope. All right, no one gets the dodgeball extra credit today as to what was it necessary for him to do? So can somebody give me a necessary condition to win the Super Bowl? No, so if you don't score at all, can you win the Super Bowl? The only question is, could they force the other team to forfeit? I'm, I'm so close to saying, I think you've got it. I'm not 100% sure that it is potentially possible they could force the team to forfeit. I don't think the other team would forfeit. <clears throat> but again, this is the mathematical one. It could be ridiculous. Yeah, could win, like, whatever conferences and like Okay, so yeah, good, good. So, ne so necessary essentially is you have to play in the Super Bowl. If you're not playing in the Super Bowl, you have to score more points than the other team. There is the possibility of could the TV, we'll just assume that no one is going to forfeit a game. And I will accept. Now, is that a sufficient condition to score more points than the opposing team? If you score more points than the other team, is that sufficient to win? Yes. Is it necessary? Yes. This is a necessary and sufficient condition. Is appearing in the Super Bowl sufficient to win? No, if you are a Buffalo Bills fan, as Professor Blackwood is here, you know, she knows quite well that being present at the Super Bowl, they did it four years in a row, is not sufficient to guarantee winning the Super Bowl. We really want to distinguish between a necessary condition and a sufficient condition. 
if the terms are tending to zero, there's a chance the sum will converge. It's necessary for convergence for the terms to tend to zero. It is not sufficient. And we'll see that uh, shortly later today. So here's the geometric series formula. Um, sometimes people use X, sometimes they use R for ratio. If R is less than one, then the infinite sum is one over one minus R. Okay, and we talked about how to prove. So let's do a special case. So let's take, oh, oh, I dropped all the exponents up there. Oh, well, okay, it should be R squared, R cubed out of the fourth. Um, all right. So we're going to show in the special case when I equals one half, that this is going to converge to what we say. And so if you put R equals one half, it should converge to two. So we start our walker at time zero at zero. And after the first step, they move to one. They've covered half the distance to two. The next step is one half, which again is gonna cover half the distance to two. The next step is one quarter. Again, they cover half the distance to two. So after each step, the distance they have to go is half of what it was a moment ago. And so this should hopefully let you believe that the geometric series formula is at least reasonable in the special case when R equals one half, it does look like it's converging to, um, to two. All right, this is the algebra proof I mentioned earlier. So I'm gonna skip that. And I'm going to go to a basketball game. So who here knows their basketball history and can give me the names of these two players? Magic Johnson and Larry Bird. So I grew up in the eighties. So I would clearly choose you know, key Celtic, key Laker. And so they're gonna play a game of hoops. First one to get the basket wins. Do you wanna shoot first or second? First, right? First one to make the basket wins. There's a huge advantage in going first. We will assume that these are idealized basketball players. They don't get tired and their probability of getting a basket is independent of time. It's not gonna, you know, oh my God, it's been four hours and no one's gotten a basket yet. You know, they're still gonna shoot as well as always, okay? And we wanna calculate what is the probability that Bird wins? Well, let's assume Bird always gets a basket with probability P. Let's assume Magic always gets a basket with probability Q. And we'll let X denote the probability that Bird wins. We want to calculate what's the probability Bird wins. He always makes a basket with probability P, Magic with probability Q. So let's break it into cases. What's the probability Bird wins on his first shot? P. What's the probability Bird wins on his second shot? Not, okay, it's not quite P squared. P squared would mean Bird got his first shot and his second shot. If Bird wins on his second shot, what happened on the first shot? He missed, what else happened? Magic, Magic missed. One minus P, one minus P times yes, times P. times P. What's the probability Bird wins on his third shot? Good, so it's gonna be miss, 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 hit. And we can keep going and on and on and on. So for Bird to win on his nth shot, there's gonna be n minus one misses from each followed by a P, Bird finally made the basket. Well, rather than keep writing one minus P, one minus Q, let's denote this by R, okay? So the probability that Bird wins is just gonna be P, the probability Bird wins on his first shot, plus RP wins on his second, plus R squared P wins on his third and so on. Everybody comfortable with this? So this is an infinite sum. It seems reasonable that this sum should converge. You know, eventually one of them will get a basket unless P and Q are both. More than just very, very low, zero. As long as they're not zero, eventually one of them should get a basket. So it makes sense that this sum should converge. And so if we knew the geometric series formula, we'd be done. And this would be a nice application of why do we care about things like these sums? Well, here's a nice problem that I'm trying to analyze. I'm trying to see what's the probability Bird wins. I might want to put some bets on this and I might want to get a sense of what's a fair amount to bet. What's maybe good odds to give for the game. Let's try to look at it another way. Let's try to solve this without using the geometric series formula. And by doing this, we're actually gonna prove the geometric series formula and learn a really good concept for economics and game theory. So let's calculate another way 
the probability that bird wins. We saw that with the Fibonacci's earlier today. When we were trying to calculate the area of the rectangle, if you can calculate something two different ways, you can often get nice relations. So what's the probability bird wins on his first shot, P? What's the pro what must happen if bird is not gonna win on his first shot for bird to have a chance of winning? Magic must miss. So let's assume bird misses and magic misses. And from this point on, bird now has the ball, bird's getting ready to shoot. What is the probability from this point onward that bird wins? It's not P. P is the probability that bird wins on this shot. What is the probability that bird wins eventually? The answer is on the board. Yes. So what, so what would it be? Yeah, it's just X. If X is the probability bird wins at the start of the game, once they both missed, it's like we're at the start of the game again. It's a memoryless process. It doesn't matter how you got there. Does anybody play chess here? In chess, you have a tie if you have a threefold repetition of configurations on the board. Chess is a finite game because of something like that. When you're playing tic-tac-toe and it's your turn to go, does it matter the order in which the pieces were put on the board or does it only matter what the game state is at the time? Only matters what the game state is. And so you wanna be very careful what matters, what doesn't matter. Once bird and magic both miss, because they don't tire, it's like we just started playing the game at this moment. Well, the probability that bird wins when he has the ball, we, we call that X. Now, rather than having an infinite sum, we have a finite sum. X equals P plus one minus P one minus Q times X. We can solve this with algebra. This is just P plus RX. We bring uh, the X, the RX over to the other side and get one minus R times X equals P, where X is P over one minus R. And since X is that geometric series, we can cancel the P's and now we have a formula for the geometric series. So this is a nice way to see the answer by considering a memoryless process. And this is an idea that comes into a lot of advanced economics and math when you're analyzing game theory. You have to be extremely careful when you prove something that you don't take too much from it. So if you need good quotes, Mark Twain is one of the people to turn to. I think my favorite is, you know, at 14, I was ashamed at my father's ignorance. At 21, I was amazed at how much he had learned. Not the dad who's learning things, but another one of his is a cat that jumps on a lit stove will not jump on a lit stove again, nor will it jump on a cold one. To each experience in life, only draw from it the lesson you should. When we looked at this, what must be true about R when we're doing this calculation? What can you tell me about R? Yes. So if R were to be one, I would need both P and Q to be zero, which means bird and magic suck and the game would not end. And so I agree that you, we should not be using this when R equals one. What else must be true about R? What kind of number is R? R is one minus P times one minus Q. I'm sorry? So it must be less than one. So could it be negative eight? <laughs> Why the, yes, it's between zero and one. R is the product of two probabilities, the probability of bird missing and the probability of magic missing. So we're not proving the geometric series formula here if the absolute value of R is less than one. We're only doing it for non-negative R. There are some tricks you can do that would allow you to get it for negative R from this. But we can actually generalize this. If you know complex numbers, the formula is still true if the absolute value of R you know, say, you know, e to the i, you know, pi over four, it would work for that, uh, sorry, one, one half of that, so it's a number less than one. You could do complex numbers here, this proof would not do that. All right, so I'm gonna you know, skip the rest of that. Um, what I wanna do now is quickly talk about the harmonic series for the last five minutes. How many of you have seen the harmonic series before? So this is a nice one, it's just, the sum of the reciprocals of the integers. So it's one, 
then the first two gives us 1.5, the first three about 1.83, the first 10,000 give us about 9.78, the first maybe million give us about 14.39. What do you think is true about this sum as I take more and more terms? What do you think? It will always increase, but will it increase to infinity or will it increase to a finite amount? When you add more and more terms for the geometric series where i equals a half, you're getting closer and closer and closer to two. And I'm getting closer and closer and closer to the wall, but I never hit the wall. So do we think that this is gonna grow without end? I mean, it's growing slowly. I added a million terms and I've only gone from about 1.5 to 14. It's tough to tell. And so I'm gonna give a quick, a couple of proofs that it does diverge. So one possibility is let's assume that the sum is finite. So if the sum is finite, the sum of the odds is finite, the sum of the evens is finite, correct? Does everyone agree that the odds would have a larger sum than the evens because term by term, the odds beat the evens? Yes. But notice, that the evens, I can pull out a factor of two from everything, and that's just half the total sum. So the total sum is equal to the evens plus the odds. The odds are greater than the even, so this is greater than even plus even, but that's twice the even sum, which is the whole thing. So you can't have a number greater than itself. This proves that the harmonic series diverges. Anything that's this important should be proved multiple times. Um, so let me give another proof. So I'm looking at the numbers one plus a half plus a third plus a fourth plus a fifth plus a sixth plus a seventh and so on and so on and so on. If we group the terms well, we can get a sense of what's going on. So one third plus one fourth. Does everyone agree that that's larger than one fourth plus one fourth? What's one fourth plus one fourth? A half. If I do one fifth plus one sixth plus one seventh plus one eighth, each term there is at least one eighth. If I add them all together, I get four eighths, which is also a half. For the next one, if I go from one ninth all the way to one sixteenth, each term is at least one sixteenth. I have eight of them. That's at least one half. So as I keep going down like this, I can get a lower bound for any finite sum. It's going to be slow. You know, if I want to get an extra factor of a half, I have to double the number of terms I look at. It's growing slowly, but it is growing. You could similarly do upper bounds. You know, if I did um, one, instead of replacing things with things that are a little bit low, I could replace things with a little bit higher and I could sandwich this. And this is one of the themes the book talks about is if you have a sum, if you can sometimes sandwich it between two things you understand, you can get a sense of its behavior. Okay, and so here, this is a proof that the harmonic series diverges. So we now have an example of a sequence where the terms are tending to zero, but the sum goes off to infinity. We also have a sequence, the geometric sequence, where the terms are tending to zero, but the sum is finite. Because we now have two examples, one going in each direction, we know that if the terms tend to zero, it is not a sufficient condition to converge, it is not a sufficient condition to diverge. It sometimes converges, it sometimes diverges. It's necessary for the terms to tend to zero for the sum to converge, but it is not sufficient. So what we'll do on Monday's class is we will start going through the different tests in chapter 10. So we're gonna go through chapter 10 somewhat quickly. You should be finished your reading of chapter 10 by Monday. If there are things in particular that were unclear, let me know and I will talk to you talk about them in greater detail here. I really wanted to spend the time today talking about how you make sense of what's going on, where you see some of these and getting a feel for why we care and study these things. All right, have a great weekend all.